you can reduce your taxable income by whatever the amount of your loss is from your business. So that's a good thing, as Martha Stewart would say. Tonight, I am going to talk about taxes. And in taxes, I'm going to talk about, we're going to go over the forms that, that, that I've handed out to you here, sort of a common fact pattern of, of artists. Usually, the question, the areas that people have concerns about I want to do this talk are auto expenses, office and home expenses, depreciation, and one main thing that I want to talk about, uh, well, travel entertainment and then other deductions that we'll get into also. One thing I would like to talk to a little, a little bit about is hobby losses. The IRS doesn't understand artists, and they look at a, a person who is an artist and is de uh, you know, uh, deducting art, art expenses a lot of times as if this is a hobby. You know, this is a personal expense, you, you are having a great time being an artist, and uh, you shouldn't be deductible, though, because it's, it's just too much fun. But uh, so they don't realize, you know, that it's just a passion for you, and, uh, you know, you're going to be an artist no matter what anyway, usually. So they do have a, a rule, and it's called the Hobby Loss Rules. And what, what that rule says is basically that if you aren't in business to make a profit, then you can't deduct the expenses related to that business. There are a couple of presumptions, one main one, uh, in, the, in the law, and that says that you are presumed to be in business to make a profit, which means you can deduct your expenses, if you have profit, net pro a profit is basically your income is greater than your expenses, in three out of five years. So, so basically, if you're making money, they, they, they're okay. They'll have you pay tax on, on that because it's uh, you're making money. Now, this is a presumption, though. So this doesn't mean that if you don't make a profit in three out of five years that you can't still deduct the loss on your, on your art business. The way to get around, not to get around that, but just to sort of do satisfy their criteria, there's uh, actually, the, there are some actual internal revenue regulations that I have in the back two pages of the handout. And these are sort of the factors that they... Uh, that they take a look at when somebody gets audited and says, all right, I don't think you're in business to make a profit. So I'm just going to highlight nine factors. I'm going to highlight a couple of them that you know, they pay mo the most attention to. And one of the main ones is the manner in which you conduct the business. That's the first one. Do you conduct your business in a business-like fashion? So what that means is basically, do you keep a set of books? Do you do your tax filings? Do you do your sales tax returns? Do you have a business license? Do you pay your taxes? <laughs> so that, that's a key one there. If, you, if you're, you know, they will say normally somebody who is, uh, has a hobby is not going to keep track of all this stuff. So that's one thing. Another one is the expertise. So if you've got a, an MFA, uh, that certainly means you have an expertise. And being a, an artist and having expenses it would be appropriate. Uh, for me, and I'm a, you know, just doing this on the side, then, then, and I don't have a background in the arts, then, then it's not, that's not good for you as far as figuring out whether you can deduct the expenses. Another criteria is how much time do you spend on it? You know, do you spend all, the, all your time on it or a significant portion of it, or are you just doing it, you know, on the weekend or whatever, which I find most of my clients can't do it that way. You know, if you're, you can't just do it for two minutes or two hours at night and then, uh, you know, let it go. So you do normally spend most of your time in art. Okay, others, financial status. So it shouldn't necessarily make a difference, but if you are a, a trust fund person and you are spending, and you really don't have a job, but this is all you do, that's, and you lose money at it, that is some evidence that maybe, well, maybe this is really not a business, but a more of a hobby. Conversely, if this is what you do and you are spending a lot, most of your time on it, then that's, that's much better as far as having it be a uh, business. They don't require you to make a profit. As a matter of fact, there are court cases where this one woman, she was an artist and didn't make a profit for 23 straight years. So, uh, and she still won in tax court. That uh, she was, in a, uh, there's actually been a couple cases like that. So, you know, and I do have clients that, you know, they, they are, they're, they're trying to make a living at it, but it, it's hard, you know. You, you, you make $10,000 a year from your artwork, and that's actually pretty darn good. And in a lot of cases, that's, you know, you're being successful, I think. So that's a situation. The final one that they have here is number nine. That's elements of personal, personal pleasure or recreation. And that's where, you know, again, they, they think, oh, they're, they're, you know, you guys are just having a great old time. So 
I, I don't think that's as much of an issue. Where these Hobby Loss rules really came into play were from doctors and dentists trying to deduct their horse breeding activities. So there's just a, a, it's an unbelievable amount of cases in that, for that. that uh, and about 2% of them are successful, generally speaking, of the, of the doctors and dentists. So that's where they're coming from. So anyway, does anybody have any questions relating to their specific interest? Is it better to be classified as a hobby or a business? So if it's a hobby, uh, any expenses you have, or any income you have, you have to pay tax on, and then you basically deduct the, the expenses up to the amount of the income, but you can't create a loss. I'm, I'm presuming you have a loss, which means then you don't pay taxes. Let's say you had $500 in sales. You can claim basically $500 of deductions against that income, but that's it. The nice thing is that, you know, let's say again, you know, let's say you're working and you have a, you know, a job and you make $30,000 a year from it. If you do have a loss from your art business, well, you can actually take that as a, you can reduce your taxable income by whatever the amount of your loss is from your business. So that's a good thing, as Martha Stewart would say. So you would, you pay less, you know, if you, you know, if you have a, a, a $2,000 loss, Generally speaking, you may be in the 14% tax bracket or 12% tax bracket. You know, it's going to save you a couple hundred dollars per thousand dollars of a loss. Get into um, a little bit of the details of where you report your income uh, on your tax return. And that goes on Schedule C. So basically, Schedule C is what's called, it's the title of it is a profit and loss from business. This is basically a profit and loss statement for your business. There's a couple of specific things that I would like to point out to you on this uh, that pertain to artists. First of all, box B here is a code that you put in to, to tell the IRS what, what you do. And artists and writers use uh, code 711510. Second, your accounting method is going to be cash. The cash method, which you should take, generally speaking, says is that you take income not when you sell a painting, but when you get paid for your painting. So, and then conversely, you take a deduction not when you get a bill, but when you actually make the payment. So that's the cash basis. And generally speaking, it works better to be on the cash basis because most businesses, people owe you more money than you owe to other people. And so you get to take, you don't have to pay tax on the income that you haven't received yet, which is, is really kind of a, a bummer if you have to do that. So that's a nice, nice feature for artists and my, my, for accountants too, my business is on the cash basis. There's a couple of things I do want to point out about the cash basis. People always ask, do I get a deduction when somebody, you know, somebody, I sold a painting for $2,000 and they stiffed me and I, you know, I'm never going to see the money. Can I take a deduction for that? And the answer, unfortunately, if you're on the cash basis is no. You haven't paid, you haven't taken it into income. You haven't shown that as income since you weren't paid. And therefore, you don't get a deduction again for not getting the payment. And in fact, that'd be like double dipping. You can't take a deduction for that. Secondly, people ask, what about if I give away my art? Do I get a deduction for that? And that is, the answer is you do get a deduction for it. It's an itemized deduction. It's not a business deduction. It's an itemized deduction generally. But that deduction is not the fair market value of the painting, what, what it's being sold for at a gallery, but what your actual cost was for it which is going to be basically, you know, the, the paint and the, uh, the framing and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, and generally speaking, you've already written off those costs. You should be writing off those costs anyway when you have paid that. So basically, there's no real deduction for uh, giving away a, a painting to, to be sold at an art auction or something like that. Third one is people ask about donating services. You know, sometimes you'll maybe you don't give away art, but you volunteer, you know, at, a, at, a, at galleries or whatever, something like that. That, again, is, there's no deduction for that, uh, unfortunately. Again, it's, you're, uh, if you did have to get a deduction, if you got a deduction for it, then you'd have to take the value of your services into income, so it's just a wash. And so, unfortunately, you can't give away that and take a deduction for it. Okay, so that is, so there's some, those are some general questions that come up. Let's look at part one and line one, which is gross receipts. So basically, receipts in this instance means income, gross income that has come in. Now, this number on your tax return should always be equal to or greater than the total amount of the 1099s that you receive. Because the IRS computer in the sky 
takes all these 1099s and adds them up under your, your social security number and then compares it to your number on your tax return and they go, hey, what's, you know, what's the difference? <laughs> so that's an automatic, you'll get a notice if, it, if it's less than that. So you want it, that's the general rule. Now, so you're gonna be at least that. One other thing is even if you get paid cash and you don't get a 1099 for something, you still have to report as income. You know, we're on, we are in the honor system here, but that's, that, that is the rule that you pay tax on all income that you receive, whether it's reported or not. So I do want to tell you that. A couple of, sort. Oh, go ahead, yes. If you accept payments via Square, do you consider the price you charge the customer your income or is the amount you receive after Square takes their fee considered your income? I think Square will send you 1099 many times, depending on how much your sales are. I think it's over, I can't remember what the number is, 15,000 maybe or something like that. But the, the answer is, if they don't send you 1099, then just report the net. If they do send you the 1099, I believe they give you the gross amount that they paid you. And then you need to deduct back out the, the charges that, that they send, that they ding you for. And I would call those bank charges or credit card fees. But if, you do, if it's on a 1099, do report the gross amount. If it's not on a 1099, I'd, I'd go ahead and report the, the net amount. That's, that's fine. One other thing about credit cards, while we're on this subject, I did tell you that when you, uh, under the cash basis, when you have an expense, you don't get to take a deduction for something until you pay it. There is an exception for credit cards. So if you do charge something in December and the bill comes around in January, you can still take that deduction in, in December for, for that amount. Just be consistent, you know, year, each year, you know, whether you, you do it that way. For myself, I generally just take it when I pay it. it, it it's easier to track it that way, but, but sometimes, you know, you may buy, a, you may have a large expenditure into the year that you want to deduct in the current year, and you certainly are entitled to do it under that method. A couple other factors that come into play here. A lot of artists and creative folks get royalties, and they'll get a 1099. People are, I assume, are familiar with 1099 miscellaneouses, which is what you normally get. Uh, and then, but sometimes people will be paid a royalty, and that comes in, uh, there's a special, it's a different box that uh, is on your, uh, uh, 1099. And what, uh, what has happened in the past, I've had clients had, had trouble with this, where they get a royalty and then there is actually the rent and royalty schedule. And when you get a, when you get a 1099 that has, shows it as a royalty, the IRS computers are going to look at, going to look for this Schedule E to report your income on Schedule E. However, a royalty income to somebody who has created the work, such as yourselves, uh, is really self-employment income and should be reported as income on Schedule C. So what I do to keep the computers happy is, is that I report a royalty income on line four, actually, of, of the Schedule E, that $1,500, and then down below on line 19, I back it out, and I call it an expense. The IRS's computer is just looking for this number here, and then we're taking it off of this. There's going to be no net income on the Schedule E, but then we're going to transfer the $1,500 over to Schedule C. So that shows up on line, on, back to Schedule C. That shows up in line six in, under other income. There's that $1,500 showing up there. So that's from experience. I've had uh, uh, a little bit of issues there. What, one other issue that uh, comes into play uh, is, well, a couple other issues. We're on the cash basis. And most people who pay you are on the cash basis. And a lot of people will pay expenses right near the end of the year because they've, they've waited <laughs> to pay you for a while and they, gotta, they go, well, I want to get a deduction this year and so I'm going to pay you now. And so they pay you, they write you a check, they mail it to you, and you may not get it until the next year. But <clears throat> they put it on their 1099 as income in this year, in, in the current year. So that creates a problem because the IRS's computers are going to be looking to see that you reported you know, all that income on that 1099 on the current year, when in reality, under your method of accounting, it's, it's certainly proper to go ahead and report that on the subsequent year. So there's a few ways around that. One is just to go ahead and report it in the year that you get the 1099, and you know, maybe it's not, if it's not a big deal, it may not make too much difference. But sometimes these are big amounts, and so you don't want to pay tax before 
the current year. Or maybe this was a big income year for you and you want to take it next year when your income is going down and you'll be in a lower tax bracket. So if that's the case, what I do, there's a couple of things. First, if even with having the total, the, that payment, which is on a 1099, plus all your other 1099s, is actually less than what you want to report as your income for this year, and meaning that you want to report that, that payment in the subsequent year, then there's no issue because the, the computers are going to still see that your income that you reported is greater than your 1099s. The problem arises when it's less. So then what I do is I've called, I put that in other expenses. I haven't done it on this return here. But you do this sort of description saying income received in 2020, say, but reported on a 1099 for 2019. And it, basically you're backing it out and reporting it on the next year. Sometimes that works, sometimes you still get a notice. And so if you do get a notice, then you just have to, usually you can you know, explain it to them, either call them or write them and tell them what, what's going on, and that should take care of it. Similar issue arises when you work for somebody and they pay you both your, for your time, and then also maybe you bought some supplies that they reimbursed you for. And basically they should just be paying, they should be just reporting the amount that they pay you for services on the 1099, but a lot of accounting systems just look for you know, Joe Smith, and all right, here's the amounts we paid Joe Smith, and there it is on the 1099. So, again, may not be a problem if, they, if again, the income that you planned on reporting is greater than all your 1099s. But if it's not, then what you need to do is report the amount on that 1099 as income, but then deduct those expenses that you were reimbursed for. So that, again, everything nets out to be the same, and you, again, keep the IRS's computers happy. All right, questions on income and reporting, and I can't tell you how to make income, but, <laughs> but uh, the key thing, again, is that that number, you know, uh, on that line, uh, uh, line three, line one, excuse me, has to be equal to or greater than the, the 1099s, otherwise you'll be getting them all excited. Should I use the artist's code only if my primary income is from 1099 sources? What if most of my income is from W-2 sources? Well, so here's the answer. First of all, the W-2 isn't reported on this form. You know, that goes under wages. So we're only looking for what you are getting for your business. So that would be, in your case, the art. Kind of a similar question is too, like, you know, most artists, you're doing a lot of different stuff. You're teaching, you're, uh, you know, you're dancing and you're performing and, you know, it's amazing what everybody does. So. I generally um, keep all those together and just report it all on one uh, Schedule C. I mean, you could conceivably have one for, um, you know, dancing and one for uh, writing and one for your artwork. But I generally lump it together with the, with the theory that, you know, your, your job is really creating stuff and uh, you can combine them. One, one thing is, one advantage of that is, is that, first of all, it's easier. You don't have to have all these different forms. Secondly. If you, if, you do, if you did have a separate Schedule C, inevitably there would be some, one of the businesses that loses money probably or doesn't do as well and you might have higher expenses in that area. And that, if it stands alone, there's just more chance for them to sort of pick it apart and go, oh, why, why do you have this, you know, this loss on, in this, this area when really it's just kind of normal and it was a bad year in that one or whatever. So, so uh, I generally combine, let's put it that way. Okay, let's move back to our form here and moving to the page two of the form, we're gonna talk about cost of goods sold. So in an accounting sense, all artists have inventory because you know, you've got all, the, all these works that are out at, uh, at galleries or just hanging in your, in your studio, just you know, you're still in process or whatever. Fortunately, the IRS does not require artists to keep inventory. So you don't have to say, all right, well, you know, how much paint went involved in making that piece or whatever, you, you know, it'd be impossible really, and it's usually not very much. So you don't normally have inventory. The only difference would be uh, if you're making multiple images, let's say you're a photographer and you have a bunch of uh, uh, prints of an, an image or you're uh, an engraver or whatever, or a sculptor, and maybe you have several uh, iterations of one piece, then in that case, you have to keep inventory. But for everybody else, you just write off your costs as you incur them. Does anybody have any questions about that? How do you report your inventory? For example, photographic prints. So if you did have prints, 
uh, what you would do, you know, let's say you have 10 prints, you know, and you, you made 10 prints during the year and you sold three of them. So basically then you would have to figure out what the cost of the printing is and then you sold 30% uh, of what you, you know, made, so you, the, the remaining 70% would be ending inventory. And that shows up on line 41 of this form. And basically what that does is you put all, the, all your costs that you incurred during the year in lines 36 to 39, and then you back out from that uh, any, the cost of any unsold pieces that you haven't, maybe you haven't sold yet. So pretty easy. Sometimes, too, the, 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 time, the other time when it comes up is for um, musicians, you know, and they're gonna, or any types of artists. You might print up a bunch of T-shirts or something like that to promote you or, or, or CDs. Or, you know, you don't, there are not as many CDs nowadays, but there still are some. <laughs> so, so anyway, that, those would come into play for those type of uh, artists also. Is there a lower threshold for when you don't have to keep inventory? So as long as you're doing one print, as long as it's one, then you're okay. You know, if you're, uh, I, I have some of my clients, not many, but some will, you know, have a, they'll have several pieces, they'll go to all the, the art festivals or whatever, you know, and they'll have three or four pieces of something printed up so they can uh, sell them. Uh, so that would be a situation there uh, where you should really back that out at the end of the year, the inventory. How much self-employment income can you make before you have to declare it on your Schedule C? So the, what the IRS looks at it is that if you have self-employment income or gross income of $400 or more, then you're supposed to do the Schedule C, even if you have a loss. You know, they're, they're taking the, the approach, well, we still have this money coming in. and Well, let's get on to some, more, some of the fun side of the expenses and see if we can come up with some, uh, some things to deduct. So again, expenses are good because we're going to be reducing our income by whatever these amounts are that we get to take. Expenses are deductible if they are common in your business and accepted as a normal expense and if they're necessary. So that's where some arguments can come into play of, you know, is this necessary for your business? Did you need to go to that show to see how, to see that exhibit or whatever, which normally that's I'd take that as definitely a deduction for, for artists, any admissions. Key thing, of course, in expenses is documentation. And documentation is basically going to be able to prove that you had these expenses. So, you know, canceled check is a par partial documentation. Credit card receipt, that's, that's good. But normally, the IRS likes to see sort of both halves of that, meaning you, both that you did make the payment, which is what the check or the credit card uh, receipt will say, and also, they want like the, the cash register receipt from the art supply store to show what you're buying or, or something like that. So get both just the credit card statement and the invoice is what I would normally call that, to show what you bought. So that's two, two things you want. There is a special exception that if you have expenses, if you have an expense that's under $75, you don't necessarily have to have a receipt for it, but you do have to have some, you do want to make a contemporaneous meaning a note around the same time that this happened uh, of uh, what it was that you bought, when, when you bought it, who you bought it from, and, and the amount. Don't have, uh, you know, all your expenses be $74.99. <laughs> but it certainly is kind of a nice backup uh, in case you, uh, you know, you lose a receipt or whatever. Sometimes you go into foreign countries and they don't even give out receipts, so uh, you've got to, you, you can be uh, in trouble in that regard without this rule. Uh, all right, I'm going to talk first here about auto expenses. So, basically, when you to t claim an auto expense, you need to keep a log. Somehow you have to determine how many miles you drove for business. The best way is to keep a log. The next best way is you, you know, a lot of times clients will recreate from their calendar. You know, they go, they can go back and they go, all right, well, I came to relax with tax, and, uh, you know, that's six miles from my house or whatever, and you, know, you can recreate it that way. It's, that's kind of hard to do when you recreate them, but at least it's, it's something to fall back on to. Third way is the, the good faith estimate, and I drive 100 miles a, a month for business or something like that. That's kind of a weak, weak way to go, but if you, if you didn't keep records, and it's, you know, as long as you're conservative on that and can kind of at least back it up to some degree, that should work too. So key thing is the log, and there are, there are apps that do it, and 
I just do it on a little spreadsheet of mine. So then, you, you figure, so you know what your business miles are. And business miles are going to be things like coming here, going, uh, you know, would not be commuting to your studio. Let's say if you have a studio away from your home, uh, that commuting costs are not, deduct or not deductible miles. But it would be uh, going to, sh to galleries, going to meet with other artists, going uh, to see your agent and uh, admissions, or going to other exhibits and such. Now, a lot of artists, and we'll, get to, we'll talk about office and home a little bit later. If your office is in home, then you don't have any commute. <laughs> so it's always, you know, wherever you go for, for work would be uh, deductible. Now, when I say work, I mean not, I mean your Schedule C work. So commuting to your job is not going to be deduct going to be deductible under any circumstance. If you are a photographer, can you deduct travel to a location that you take pictures? So my approach is, you know, if you're a, um, a, a seashore photographer or a seashore, which I have an artist who's a, a, a seashore artist, you know, then I think, you know, trips there uh, certainly are deductible. I think most photographers keep a camera with them all the time. And so, uh, you know, I don't, you really can't, I, I, just because you carry a camera doesn't mean you can make a deduction. But if you're going out to the desert to have a series or, you know, or the redwoods or what have you, then certainly that's, that's deductible. It's just sort of the, the general travel and, you know, I was driving along and, oh, hey, that's an interesting shot and I took it. That's probably not going to work. But if you went out of your way just to get that shot, then yes. Oh, I want to, going to art supply stores to buy stuff for your work is certainly deductible too. Can you deduct public transit fares? Yes. Certainly, you know, if you, tonight you, ha you, you bought a BART ticket and came over, take a deduction for that. Now, nowadays it's Clipper and, you know, it's kind of all together in there. And so normally I would take a uh, percentage, you know, some reasonable percentage of, you know, uh, and of what might be for business. Again, commuting mileage, uh, you know, if you're going to the city to work or something like that, that's not deductible. But if you're going over to the city to sell something or see a show, then that would be de deductible. I download my Clipper card usage statements and use that to construct the evidence of my business use. Will that work? That's great. You know, what you might want to do in something like that is do it for like three months and then say, all right, this is, I did it for three months, this is my percentage, and, you know, I'll save you a little bit of time. <laughs> and then take that for, you know, for the rest of the year. What if I travel for business but do non-business activities on the same trip? So the ba they go, it goes to the base, basically the primary purpose for making the trip. I'm not going to argue with you <laughs> whether dinner was more important than whatever you're doing. <laughs> it was, you only went to dinner because you were over there anyway. That's right. Okay, so basically all we've done right now is we figured out how many business miles we drove. <laughs> so there's two methods of, of, me, of deducting auto expenses. One is called the simplified method, and that basically is, is that you take your, your total business miles and you multiply that by the current IRS rate that they allow for, for the use of your car, which in 2019, you get to deduct 58 cents a mile for business miles. For 2020, that's gone down to 57 and a half cents a mile. Why they bothered to make that difference, I don't know, but they did. I guess gas prices probably went down. So you can also, in addition to taking that number that we just computed, you can also add the business percentage use of DMV fees, you know, your license on your car, and uh, interest on your car loan. You can take a percentage of that. So those two numbers can be added in, as well as always you can add in the tolls and parking that are related to uh, your travel, your business travel. So pretty easy. Now, the second way is more complicated but a lot of times can, amount, uh, can result in a higher deduction for you. So you may want to definitely consider that. And that is basically that you take, you figure out what your business use percentage of your car is. So in addition to knowing how many business miles you drove, you just have to figure out how many miles you drove for the whole year. And then you take that percentage and multiply that by the actual cost of running the car, which would be gas expenses, insurance repairs, car washes, uh, AAA, tires, all that kind of stuff. And then in addition to those expenses, 
we can take something called depreciation uh, on your car. And what, what depreciation is, is that it is sort of an accounting fiction, but it takes the cost of a car and then it, you basically are allowed to write this off over a period of time, which in this instance uh, is usually five years. One, another thing that can be a problem is, you know, you don't keep your gas receipts. And so I generally, and a lot of clients do that, but you know, you can pretty much back into it. You know, you know, if you know how many miles you drove during the year, uh, you know how many miles per gallon your car gets approximately, and then you just multiply that by an average cost of gas, $3.25 or $3.50 or whatever. And that, that's okay, you can recreate it that way. A and another caveat on that is once you, uh, on a car, once you make a, a choice in which way you're gonna do it, then you should use that method for the life of that car until you get another one. Well, one thing on depreciation, we, we kind of blew through that, but they've changed the rules on car depreciation, and so it's a lot more um, favorable to clients. Uh, you can, depending on how much you pay for the car, you can take a pretty big deduction the year that you buy the car and the, ne and the subsequent year. So you might not want to overlook that. Uh, you shouldn't overlook it, I guess is a better way to say that. Uh, so consider that. All right, let's talk a little bit while we're talking about this thing called depreciation. Let's talk about that some. That goes on, is reported on Form 4562. Basically, depreciation, again, is an accounting fiction to basically sort of allocate the cost of something that has a, the, uh, some item that has, a va has an estimated useful life of over a year. So, you know, if you're buying supplies that are just going to be consumed currently, then you don't have to go through that. But if you're buying, uh, you know, sound equipment or, you know, racking for your, for, uh, your, your studio or computers, obviously, uh, then those normally would be depreciated. There's a, it's gotten pretty nice now where you can basically um, just write off the cost of the equipment in the year that you purchase it. And so there's this, what's called, uh, there's a special provision. There's two ways of doing it, but the main one you guys should use is really just, you will just take 100% of the depreciation in the, of the cost in the year that you buy it. Now, you, the only time you may not want to do this is if you are creating a loss in the current year and you know that you're going to have income in future years because what will happen is, is that if you have a loss this year, yes, it will reduce your taxable income, but if you're going to make if you plan on making, a, expect to make a profit in future years from your business, that expense that you take this year will not be able to be a deduction in future years where it would actually reduce your self-employment tax, which is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But basically, the self-employment tax is something that is paid on your personal earnings, uh, and it's equivalent to the FICA and Medicare tax that is, that is taken out of your paycheck. Only it's double because for uh, for employee employees have to have a certain amount taken out of their check, and the employer has to match it. But when you're self-employed, you have to pay both halves. So we'll get to that momentarily. Again, the depreciation just report it, and and uh, and, and just deduct. I normally deduct it in the year that I uh, the, the the equipment is purchased. If I bought a PC two years ago, but I started my art business last year, can I still take a depreciation deduction on the PC? Good question. So what happens is, is that, and that this common fact pattern, you know, you, you, let's say you have a computer that you've been using personally, and then now you're using it in your business. So you can take a deduction for that. You can't take the cost of that computer, but you look to what the value is in the year that you started using it. And who knows what <laughs> used computers are worth, but you, know, you have to come up with some, some figure and take it that way. How much does a piece of equipment need to be worth for it to depreciate? I would say if something costs over like 500 bucks, put it on the depreciation. But if it's under, call it supplies or tools. But the end result is you're going to reduce your income by the, the amount, which is good. Let's talk about travel. That's always a fun one. Uh, and when I say travel, I mean uh, not uh, the auto that we were just talking about, but this is going away from, from your home overnight for business. So, uh, and we're, we'll talk, meals, we're going to talk about 
separately, and that'll happen right after we talk about travel. So basically, if your primary purpose for your trip is for business, then you can deduct the cost of the airfare. Assuming it's 50% assuming it's or more for business, you can deduct the airfare. And then for the days that you are away from home for business, you can deduct the hotels, car rental, bus uh, transfers, uh, parking out at the, uh, you know, at the airport or what have you, all those types of costs. If you travel with uh, a partner, then you, you can't take a deduction for that person's expenses. But normally, you know, like a hotel room, they're not going to charge you more if there's two people, so it doesn't make any difference. But you certainly wouldn't be able to take that person's meals, which, again, we'll talk about in a minute, but, or their airfare. So that's pretty straightforward. And then when you're traveling, you know, so we talked about lodging, uh, auto rental, cleaning laundry. You know, if you have some laundry that you have to do, don't take your laundry with you, but any that you generate. <laughs> Did all your dry cleaning with you. All right, let's talk about meals while we're at on this. And we're going to talk about entertainment after this. It used to be that it was combined, but now it's different. So meals, first of all, the rule for meals, meals are only 50% deductible. So you spend $25 for dinner somewhere, that will show up as only 50% of that uh, being a deduction on your Schedule C. That includes the tip, tax and tip, you know, it's out the door. But let's look at, let's go back to Schedule C for a sec. There's a line for, line 24 is travel and meals, and line 24B is deductible meals. And that number is basically 50% of the total amount that you expend for meals. So on meals, you do want to, you know, we talked about having receipts. For meals, there, there's a requirement that you have receipts. And basically what I do, what, what you need to do is you have to have some evidence of where you went, how much you spent, the date you did it, who, uh, the business purpose of it, and the, the relationship of the person if you take somebody out to, to lunch or dinner or whatever. And by the way, these meals, these meals are not necessarily travel meals. These could be meals in town, you know, that you're taking, meeting with your uh, agent or what have you. Or, um, or, you know, a lot of times people will have artists' nights you know, where they get together with their artist friends every, every month or something like that. I, I would take your cost for that, too. I did say that the general rule is 50% deductible. If you build somebody, or if, you're, if you are doing services for somebody and, and you also incurred meals that they reimbursed you for, uh, or a client, sometimes you will bill that to a client, then those meals are 100% deductible. And so you can take 100% of that. So if you are reporting the income, plus the, this, the expenses are reimbursed as income, then you can deduct 100% of the meals. So that's a fairly narrow exception, but it can be. Will the credit card statement suffice, or do I need the receipt? It really should be the credit card receipt. What I do is just I, I get the credit card receipt, I just write down you know, what, what's going on, then I just stick it in an envelope. So it's pretty, it's not onerous. But you, know, you can fall back on, if you've got in your calendar that you had lunch with you know, Jane's, Jane Jones, and, you know, that pretty much backs that up of what was going on, if you can prove who she is, meaning as a, some sort of business relationship. When you travel away from home overnight, you, you fly to L.A. or whatever and spend the night down there for business, you can either do these meals, like we're just talking about, or there's another way you can do it, which is called a per diem. And what that is is that the IRS publishes for various cities how much they will allow you to take without any receipt. But this is only for travel away from home, okay? So it's not, you know, having your, your dinners here. So look up uh, on the web, it's, uh, I think it's GSA per diem rates is what it's under. And in there it'll show you, you know, San Francisco gets $71 a day, Fresno is going to get 60, you know, depend, big cities get the most and little cities get the least generally speaking. Foreign travel gets a lot. You know, if you go to London, it's like $150 a day or something like that for meals, uh, if it's for business again. Also remember, though, that number, you have to still reduce that by 50% to, uh, for the expense. So that's key. When you look on this site, you will see a, a bunch of columns of numbers. Those numbers really are, inclusive, uh, are showing amounts for lodging for almost all of them. But for self-employed people, you can't use those tables for lodging. You can only use them for per diem, for the meals. So the meals are, on the, are in the far right-hand column. It'll be M plus IE. 
uh, which is meals and incidental expenses. So that's the number you're looking for. And it should be somewhere between 50 and $75. So that's a nice way to go when you uh, don't have receipts. And even if you do, if you, you know, if you're, you go to New York and you're uh, staying with friends and uh, you're eating in all the time, you still can go ahead and take these, uh, these uh, deductions. That's assuming those are days for business. A and, you know, I've had clients that, um, you know, they go on uh, artist residencies or something, they'll be gone for a month or something like that or what have you. And so, I mean, it can, it can add up. So that's the second way. And so that comes in handy. That's a good fallback position. So I have a lot of clients go, all right, here's my itineraries. And then, I, you know, we got to look them up and see what, what it all adds up to. All right. Under the new tax law, which was passed, in, and we've already gone through it one year, uh, that was effective for 2018, entertainment is no longer deductible. But a lot of what you think might be entertainment maybe not, is not entertainment and may be deductible. So let's talk about that. So true entertainment is, you know, getting your tickets to the opera and taking a, a friend or even a business acquaintance to the opera. That's entertainment, but it, and you're not, you know, if you're a singer or something like that, then that's one thing. But if you're just an accountant, or <laughs> shall we say, that would be, that's entertainment. In the old days, if you actually had a business discussion before, during, or after that entertainment, you could take a deduction for that. That is no longer the case, all right? So you even... Uh, you know, going to movies, going to Giants games, wherever. That's just not deductible. However, artists do a lot of things that normally would be entertainment. For example, going to a ballet, uh, if you're a dancer, going, you know, going to, certainly going to an exhibit or um, any sort of performances. If you're a musician, any concert you go to. Filmmakers, any films you go to, any of that kind of stuff. Plays for actors, those are deductible, 100%. And I normally call that either admissions or, uh, generally it's admissions is what I call it. And uh, it's a nice, nice little bonus. So don't think entertainment just because you are being entertained, <laughs> if it relates to your business. I mean, you may, you could very well have, you know, again, you go to a Giants game and you're an artist and that's not gonna be, that's not gonna work. We didn't, I wanna talk about office and home. I'm gonna do office and home and then self-employment tax and then we'll be out of time. So. Office and home is taken on Form 8829. The rules on this are that if you use an area in your residence exclusively and regularly as your principal place of business, then you can take a deduction. A real common fact pattern is a spare bedroom. Now, artists don't usually do that. So you will normally have a garage or something, or maybe you have a spare bedroom. But generally speaking, you don't necessarily have a only a bedroom, it could be something more. But the point of it is, is that the spot has to be used ex basically exclusively. So, you know, you can't do the dining room table and take a deduction for that because that's where you, even if you work there all the time, but you know, you have used it also personally, then that, that's unfortunately, it's not exclusively. But if you, do, if you do have an area, even if it's a portion of a room, you know, sometimes you'll have a the corner that you use for your business, and it's even your own bedroom, you know, you can still take a little bit of a portion of that, too. Another thing about artists that I learned when I first started working with them is that the, sometimes artists have a, live workspaces, and there's an enormous amount that they take for the percentage. You know, normally a percentage is, you know, 10% or something like that. But I remember specifically my jaw dropped when somebody was writing up 80% of their rent. But then I went out to their place and it was, you know, it was live work and it's, that's the way it was, a nice studio and such. So, so basically, you just, it, this is uh, very much akin to the auto expense in that you need to come up with the business use percentage of your house. And again, it's exclusively or regularly for business. Then when you do that, you can then take a percentage of your rent, utilities, Insurance, that's normally the three big ones for renters. If you own your house, it's, it gets more complicated. But basically, it's the same concept. You just get, you get, instead of your rent, you're able to deduct a portion of your uh, mortgage interest and property taxes in addition to the other expenses. You do also get to depreciate your house, which is a little more complicated. But that you can take, you can do also. So then there's a little trick to this is that uh, we've, we, down here, we basically, on the form here, we're figuring out the total expenses and then on line 24, we're just multiplying the total expenses by the business use percentage that we computed. Now, there's a limit, limiting 
factor, though, for office and home expenses, you can take the deduction and bring your income down to zero, but you cannot create a loss with the business home expense. So if that happens, if you do have, if it would create a loss, then you can't, you, you can't take that as a deduction currently, but you get a carryover to uh, future years, and that's on line um, 43, uh, basically, is where you put that on, where th that would be the excess of deductions that you can't take this year, but you can take in future years. That's basically it on that. It's a good deduction. You know, most, most of you probably will have it to, to some degree, so don't uh, overlook it. One other item that I want to get into that is new, actually it was around last year, and is there's a new form this year for that. And I don't know if anybody remember, knew this, but in 2018, part of the new tax law said that if you are in a, uh, if you're in business and you make a profit from your business, you can take a deduction of 20% of the net profit of the business. And that's called the qualified business deduction. And so that deduction is on form 8995. So again, this is only if you have profit from your business. This is not wages, but this is your, your, your net income on Schedule C basically. So this form allows you to basically compute the, the amount of the deduction. So it's 20% of your net income uh, up to certain limitations. And the, the form will kind of walk you through it. If you make, there are further limitations if your income is over, if you're single, 160000 and married, 320000 So. Once you get to that point, you probably need to pay somebody to do your return. Probably you can afford it, too. So, <laughs> Assuming nobody's in that situation, then it basically is 20% of your net income is what it'll wind up being. So it's a good deduction. Let me walk you through what, what happened. So down here, we've com on line 15, we've computed the amount of the deduction, and that's 1763. Okay. So that's the deduction. Then that goes on page one of the return, and that goes down on line 10. So that's, it's, it's, don't overlook it. And if you did last year, if you made a profit last year and you forgot about it, you can file an amended, an amended return and get your money back for uh, last year, if it makes any sense. All right, we've got a couple more minutes. I did want to talk self-employment tax. So especially for people just starting out who've been wage earners all their lives and then start their business and start to make money, the self-employment tax is a big deal, unfortunately. It, it's basically... 15.3% of your net income from your business, which if you don't make, if you're in a relatively small tax bracket, uh, the self-employment tax is more than your income tax. So don't forget about that. So anytime you have a profit on a Schedule C, you fill out also Schedule SE. And as you go through this, you walk through your form and basically you're paying 15% on your self-employment income. It actually is slightly less than that, but I won't go into that detail. The form should walk you through that. So you don't do it on dividends or uh, interest or anything like that, just on business income. Finally, when you're first starting out especially, you may, may not know about estimated tax. Does anybody, does that ring any bells? Somebody say yes, there we go, there we go, good. All right, so basically when you're a wage earner, you have taxes withheld from your paycheck. Uh, and normally that comes out to be pretty close to what you wind up owing. And, Hopefully you get a refund or you don't owe too much. But when you're self-employed, nobody's taking out any money from your, from your earnings. And so the IRS still wants you to pay that money throughout the year rather than at the end of the year. Uh, and so you do that by making quarterly estimated tax payments. And I've included in here a form 1040 ES. And these forms are really just coupons that you uh, attach with your check, uh, or send with your check, I should say, to the IRS. And the, uh, the uh, address is on there. So basically, to compute this, you want to figure out, uh, you have to figure out kind of what I think I'm going to make this year, in the upcoming year, and then figure out the tax that's going to be on that, and then you pay that in four different installments. The first installment is due April 15th, then it's June 15th, September 15th, and then January 15th of the subsequent year. It's kind of hard to figure out. There are, what I do for a lot of clients is, is that I just base it on the next year's estimates on the current year's tax. And so, you know, assuming your income is going to be roughly the same in 2020 as it is in 2019, you just figure out how much 
tax you owed this year and then subtract any expected withholding from that and then that's the amount you should pay in quarterly estimates. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it now. Uh, I will be, I'll stick around if you have questions, come up and talk to me. Thank you for coming here and spending our time together and uh, good luck with your taxes. If you have a quickie question, send me an email. Yeah.